employers from creating the problem inadvertently. This is the, just trying to clarify existing law and making sure that this bill follows the existing precedents we've had, that the federal government will not contribute to the deaths of over 450 people a year along the border by causing a mixed signal that you come here, we'll you'll get benefits. If you come here legally, you get it. We've always said illegal um, ben benefits do not go to those who are illegal present, and that my amendment just clarifies that we'll check so that when someone says S these guys, that somebody's going to get these benefits, you can say, no, they're not, because in the bill, it clarifies that you've got to make sure that they're legally present before anyone gets this. And it takes that issue off the counter. And I did not mean this to sabotage it. I meant it to clarify so it isn't something we discuss on later and have to argue about later. Again, okay, reclaiming my time, I'd further yield to the gentleman from India. I just want to say to uh, my colleagues uh, that the American people and the Congress has taken the position that illegal aliens should not be getting benefits here in the United States at taxpayers' expense. And whether you call them undocumented or illegal or whatever term you use, they should not be entitled to benefits because the law specifically says that they are not entitled to those benefits. It has nothing to do with the race, the color, or their origin, or where they come from. If they are not here legally, they should not be entitled to the benefits of the people of this country and the government of this country. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, Ohio. Ohio. <laughs> I move to strike the last word for, for the purpose of a the question the the five minutes. of the amendment, um, if he would. Uh, it has been repeated on the other side over and over that this is current law. I am not aware that my wife was subject to E-Verify. Um, our, our spouses or partners of members of Congress subject to E-Verify because I am not aware that my wife was. And so you keep saying this is existing law. Um, can you show me where that is? The gentleman yield? Yeah. It has been the laws that your, your uh, spouse gets benefits on were not passed at a time whenever E-Verify was being included in all um, and sure, verification I, was not required. Taking back my time, so you would set a different standard for members of Congress. No, oh, members of Congress is the fact that the, every employee has to have it. What this would do is, as benefits are expanded, the, the verification also follows the expansion. Well, gentlemen, you? Yes. Yeah. Let, let me just, we're we'll sort of spinning this out in, in, in more and more absurd ways. So what, what the gentleman is saying that we, we now have to be afraid of gay people coming over the border, marrying federal employees. This is what your amendment is, is this is what your changes, you actually think. We got gay folks coming over the border, marrying federal employees in order, I'm not marrying, that's right, that's right, not marrying, entering into domestic partnerships to get benefits as federal employees. They, they have to sign an affidavit. They have to surrender themselves to a federal uh, authority anyway to sign the affidavit and make all these claims that we got laid out here. You think that this is really, you know, this is where it, it becomes just too incredible to believe. And, uh, you know, look, I think there are, there are concerns that we ought to be grappling with, but gay people coming over the border and marrying federal employees just to get benefits, not marry, I'm sorry, uh, enter into, I, I don't think this is really one of them. And, and, you know, so forgive me if I see this as being something other than a realistic threat. The gentleman from I, Ohio I, I yield to the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you. I, I just want to make sure we just cut to the chase, and, and I appreciate his yielding. Uh, let's just do one amendment that would deal with gay illegal immigrants who want an abortion at Gitmo. I yield back the balance of my time, yeah, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yield back the balance of time. Gentlemen from uh, Indiana, word. seek yeah. recognition. Move to strike the last word. Right. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Um, obviously, I don't. I don't think uh, gay people are going to come across the border to marry a uh, uh, government worker, but I do think some who are here might, and I think it's more of a matter of precedent as to whether we should uh, put this in all legislation if we need to go back and and make sure that uh, people who get married who, who are 
uh, currently in the government, I think it's a, a good check, quite frankly. Uh, and I think many Americans, if not the overwhelming percentage, agree with that. But I earlier tried to get recognition from a gentleman from uh, Rhode Island uh, because uh, I, I take deep offense and, and personal offense at some of the, the comments regarding the whole uh, gay rights issue. We didn't raise this bill. We didn't try to use this as a wedge issue. It has been thrust upon us. I do not like <clears throat> to talk about this subject. It is a very deep and difficult subject. I personally have <clears throat> deeply held <clears throat> excuse me, moral views that <clears throat> are obviously shared by the Catholic bishops, uh, who presumably were also in the gentleman's denunciation, um, that, um, <clears throat> and that I don't believe that from my perspective this is worse than people who uh, commit other things that I dis disagree with. And that's why I'm, I'm not particularly comfortable. But I do believe that as a moral country, uh, as a country that was founded in these values, we have always paid tribute to these values of traditional marriage. And that the thrust of this bill, of which a number of these amendments have tried to address, have highlighted what is clearly a deep cultural divide in this country. And that when it's thrust at us, we're going to defend it. It doesn't mean we're trying to get some kind of partisan advantage. I'm telling you, I would rather not have this debate. Um, but, but if the debate is here, then I'm going to engage in the debate because I'm not going to be intimidated because it happens to be my moral views that suddenly my moral views are irrelevant, that I can't talk about my views, I can't talk about my beliefs, which happen to be, by the way, as has been pointed out, backed up by every referendum held in the United States, the, the, the views of the majority of the American people. So we have a right to express those. I believe that those who harass, who mock, who persecute, who discriminate against in a, any kind of personal level, those who don't have the same sexual orientation are wrong. And that Christians, such as myself, have an obligation to say that that is wrong behavior. But it does not mean that whether it's back door, like this bill does, or front door, like the Defense of Marriage Act repeal would do, have a right to, to do that and silence us where we can't raise it without being accused of some kind of bigot. We have a difference of opinion. And when we say my friend at different times, we really mean our friends. We've worked together on alcohol and mental health issues. It, we can have disagreements on something like this without me being bigoted. And that's why we were talking about yield? the words. With the gentleman I'll yield. I just, the hypocrisy is, is amazing because you, you talk about the Roman Catholic Church and marriage. Um, the Roman Catholic Church annulled my parents' marriage after 27 years of marriage. That's the, that's the church you're referencing right now. They said that it was non-existent. Okay, I'm just making a point that your Christianity, that the morals and the values that you espouse right now, where they're coming from, the hypocrisy is so deep you can cut it with a knife. If, if I may reclaim, uh, I, I think you need to be more personally careful. The fact is, as you would know, and I'm, I'm not Catholic, just for the record, that, the, um, uh, that no person who claims to be a Christian claims to be perfect. And nobody claims who's a Christian doesn't claim that there's a certain amount of hypocrisy. The question is, is do we pay at least tribute to values in our country that are anchored in those values, and do we strive for those values? We fall short. Yes, at different times, I don't personally uh, agree with that uh, form uh, of annulment. I understand, however, that many good people get divorced and they remarry. They remarry because they understand that this is our goal of what we want to be, and that, that there is a deep difference, and it may in fact be changing in our culture as to what that diff difference can be. But we have to be able to have a debate and a legitimate discussion during that opinion without disparaging what is American history, what's my opinion, which right now is the majority of the American people, without calling us uh, that we're using this for political purposes, that we're trying to inflame people. I wish we didn't inflame people. I wish we could have a discussion of this is really about certain basic values we have always had in America. These basic values are under attack, and I believe that I have a right to defend those values without having my motives disparaged. That's all I'm asking. Go back. The gentleman from Virginia, seeking recognition? I, I thank the chairman and I will be brief. I want to say to my friend from Indiana, um, I, I heard him and I, I respect his sincerity. And I take the point that um, he has a right 
to express his views and to defend his values and to articulate his worldview. And, <clears throat> but I hope that my friend from Indiana would understand that sometimes on this side, when we hear some rhetoric, not yours, we hear the same assault you feel tonight on our values, on our worldview, on our right to articulate a different set of principles and values that are equally sincere. And if we could find that as common ground, irrespective of the legislation in front of us, this body would be a lot more functional. I yield back. Will the gentleman yield? The, of course. I, I agree with the gentleman's statement. And I think public discourse has, has uh, declined and we are under a incredible pressure right now in Congress to watch that our discourse doesn't decline. People can sincerely disagree and deeply disagree. And I have a number of uh, uh, gay friends who deeply disagree with me on this issue. It doesn't mean they're not friends. It just means we deeply disagree on this issue. And we need to do that without disparaging each other. I agree with my friend. Thank you. Uh, uh, gentleman, woman from uh, California. <laughs> okay, gentleman from California. I call for the question, Mr. Chairman. Okay, yeah, right. The question is on the Bill Bray Amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, Mr. and Chairman. the amendment is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Indiana. On that, I ask for a roll call vote. Gentlemen has requested a roll call vote, and of course, as it was agreed upon early on, all votes will be rolled until later this evening. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Or, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized to offer his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Finally, we have a published amendment, which I believe, uh, I'm sorry, I'll give it. The clerk would now designate she'll, the amendment. She'll, she'll designate and read. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 25. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Thank and you, And the Mr. gentleman is recognized for five minutes to discuss his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a pre-published amendment, and I apologize for a small technical correction you'll see in the amendment, but it, it, it is substantially the same as it was originally. Uh, but I'll cover the, the small difference. Mr. Chairman, this amendment would ensure that, first of all, there would be no cost to the taxpayer for this additional coverage. Second of all, that federal workers would set a model for taking care of and providing health care benefits to people domiciled within their homes. This amendment defines, and I believe consistent and inclusive of all the discussions had here today, any person regardless of their marital status or their gender, who is, shares a common residence with the employee, and the employ, employee provides more than half of the, and, and I, uh, the other person's uh, financial support. In the original language, Mr. Chairman, we had made the mistake of leaving adult in. We understand, and I would hope that all the members listening to this amendment here tonight understand, that it is very possible for a federal employee to take in, for example, the child of a relative, a brother or a sister, or someone else in need for a temporary time when that person is unable to, or even to take in a distant or not so distant family member who has become homeless. Under this, what we have chosen to do is to recognize that every American should have access to affordable health care. As members of Congress, we enjoy an affordable and, and very accessible health care system, one that has no exemptions for pre-existing conditions, one that is portable. As in fact, Mr. Chairman, as you know, every year we get to move from one to another of over 300 plans. Mr. Chairman, this amendment, if accepted, would state that for the person, the employee of the federal government, they would elect if, in fact, it was not an already previously paid for individual under the House or under the uh, federal rules, that they would pay the additional cost for that one, two, three or more people that they may be bringing in, such as a battered wife and two children that are going to be housed. They would pay the cost so there would be no additional cost to the taxpayer. 
but they would make this available to those who are they, they are protecting and supporting in their homes. Mr. Chairman, the reason I chose to do this without cost is obviously we do not want to have abuse, but this is a bill consistent with a bill that I authored, H.R. 3438, which would give every American access to the same high quality affordable health care that we enjoy as members of Congress. This amendment is designed and hopefully has been drafted by uh, uh, Ledge Council accurately to provide that. I believe that if this is accepted, we will have broad bipartisan uh, support both here and on the House floor. Because ultimately, having federal workers able to pay the difference between their single coverage and a multiple coverage for those people who they are supporting, whether it's for months, years, or a long period of time, has no cost to the government, would expand health care, would provide a large group of individuals with support that today they don't have, access to affordable health care. Mr. Chairman, as you know, our health care plans cost between the, the part the government pays and the part we pay, $5,000 to $6,000, a little more for, uh, for family coverage. That's very affordable. Men and women in the private sector and small businesses would love to have that. Hopefully in time we will consider H.R. 3438 and provide that high quality health care access to all Americans. But if we are considering how to provide the federal workforce with an ability to, to not have to fail to take care of those who they are otherwise providing support for, this will do it. And Mr. Chairman, I particularly would note that no member of the federal workforce should find themselves supporting somebody but not being able to afford health care for that person. That leaves them in doubt. We believe that this is a compromise. It is fiscally responsible. It would require uh, no doubt as to the scoring. And we would, uh, we would support it and ask uh, the chairman to accept it. And I yield back. Anyone seeking recognition? The gentleman from uh, Massachusetts. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, what this would do is basically uh, award federal benefits for, for same, uh, opposite sex couples who decide not to get married. Would the gentleman yield? I'm, I'm just explaining what the, what the text of it is. This would, uh, right now, for heterosexual couples, we, if, if, you, if you really are in favor of the traditional, traditional marriage and the institution of marriage, what, what this does is it obliterates that need because you're giving, you're giving benefits to opposite sex couples, they don't need to get married anymore. So I don't know how you can say you're, you know, I, I thought we were being pro-marriage, pro-traditional marriage. This just completely blows that argument up because now you're providing <coughs> spousal benefits to people who, you know, traditional heterosexual couples, you're saying we're going to give you the benefits, don't even get, don't even bother getting married. So. I'm a little puzzled, the by, that. A little an puzzled by that. No, I think the gentleman has caused enough confusion by drafting the bill. I'm going to use my time. Uh, this, this is basically obfuscation to, to the, an extreme degree. And uh, the one thing that the gentleman does not note is that unlike heterosexual couples uh, who want to share benefits, they can get married. They can simply get married. And they, that right is recognized in all 50 states. And so they can get married and the benefits, they want to start a family, create a household, those benefits come along with marriage. That right is not extended to uh, same-sex couples uh, who want to do the same thing. And uh, so this, this accomplishes nothing, in, in my opinion, uh, with respect to bringing the equality that we've been pursuing here on behalf of federal employees who just happen to be, be gay. Very hard workers, uh, 
very productive workers, but because they are gay and lesbian, and uh, we don't recognize that, that arrangement, that uh, they are denied all those benefits. So uh, I just want to ask my colleagues to uh, vote against this amendment. And I yield Mr. back. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman from Indiana, seek recognition? Oh, I sure do. For what purpose? Uh, to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized now, for five minutes. I want to minutes. make sure I've got this correct. You're going to allow two ladies to be domestic partners and get the benefits that you're talking about, or two men be domestic partners and get the benefits, but a man and a woman can't get the benefits. And you're saying, well, the reason is because they have the right to get married. But the fact is, like two men or two women, if they choose not to get married, why should they be discriminated against because they choose not to be married? Why shouldn't they be able to get the same benefits as the men and the men and the women and the women? I, I, I simply don't understand that. That sounds like to me well, a, clear, a clear case of discrimination. Yes, I'll be glad to yield. Well, we have, in, in our history, and this is your argument, uh, we've, we've been pro-family in this country. And so we have, uh, we well, have basically it, allowed the extension of benefits when there's a family situation. If I might and reclaim. That's, if, that's, where the, that's where the history of this all began. The extension of benefits yeah, was yeah. because in the traditional situation, the husband was out working and back then the wife was traditionally back in the home rearing the children. So we allowed that extension of benefits because otherwise wives would not be covered. I, I, I would like to reclaim my time. I, I, I do agree with that. I am for the traditional family and for the benefits. That but what you're saying is that a man and a man that choose to be domestic partners or a woman and a woman that choose to be domestic partners and a man and a woman that choose to be domestic partners have different uh, have a, 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 a have differences of uh, a legal status and uh, while I am for the traditional marriage and the traditional families if you're going to do this I don't see how you can say you're going to give the benefits to two men or two women and not a man and a woman because that is clear discrimination. And I'll be happy to yield to my colleague. When I was a freshman, I served on judiciary with Barney Frank, and one day he came over after I'd stated why I was opposed to something, and he said, Congressman, let me tell you why you're opposed to this. And he straightened me out. So let me tell you why you're opposed to this. I think I can straighten you out. We're stripping in this amendment the financial benefit that was in the underlying bill. We're taking away the financial cost to the federal government. What we're adding is a recognition that people who support people and are willing to support them at their own cost should have access to our broad pool and be able to support that, those supported people, whether it's a domestic partner, male or female, regardless of their gender, whether it's, in fact, a child they've taken in that they have not yet been awarded uh, custody of, whether, in fact, it's their sister who's a battered woman and they're supporting them because she has nowhere else to go, or whether it's somebody the church said, would you take this homeless person in and take care of them, and they've said yes. What we're saying is that if you're willing to do it at your own expense, we're willing to give you access to our very affordable broad pool with 300-plus plans. What we are not doing is we're not addressing your definition of an alternate lifestyle that you want to fund, and we're not addressing, quite frankly, somebody's decision to get married or not, or what the state laws are. What we're offering is a no-cost, broad capability for the federal workforce to have a benefit, but a benefit at no cost to the taxpayer. So you're voting for this because it doesn't solidify the question of gays getting a benefit. You're not doing it because somehow we're not supporting family values. We're supporting family values in the most basic sense, which is if you're not married to somebody, you don't have custody of them in a court, and yet you would like to help them, we're going to give you access to put them under your umbrella so they not be without health care, but at your expense. So you're voting no, but for a very different reason than you, you stated. And I yield back to the gentleman from Indiana. 
Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, let me um, indicate that, first of all, let me thank the ranking member, you know, uh, for offering this amendment, but I must oppose it. Access to good health care coverage does not ensure affordability. In fact, most uninsured people could not afford to pay for any federal health plan, making it nothing more than just a gesture. The goal of this legislation is to strengthen the federal workforce by creating a more inclusive environment, a workplace that respects all employees and compensates them in an equitable manner. As we have discussed more and more, private and public sector employers are moving in this direction. They are doing this because it is the right thing to do and because it strengthens their organization and institution. We have addressed issues concerning costs. The costs are relatively minor and will need to be offset before this bill goes to the floor. And we've mentioned that before. And the benefit from this legislation greatly outweighs the relatively small cost. While the ISA amendment would reduce costs, it would also undermine the purpose of the bill. I do not support setting up a two-tiered system in which employees with domestic partners will be required to pay the entire share of the health care or for their families. That's not inclusive. That extends the current discriminatory treatment. And I must oppose the amendment and I'm, uh, say to my, colleague, uh, my colleagues, I encourage you to, to actually uh, vote no on this amendment. Any other Mr. members Chairman. seeking recognition? Mr. Mr. Souter. Move to strike the last word. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Um, uh, first, I want to thank Mr. Issa for his amendment. And let me uh, assure the chairman of the subcommittee that I raised some of the same questions. Uh, did this involve government funding? And Mr. Issa explained to me that, that no, there's no government funding uh, in this. This would, and this levels the playing field. I, in subcommittee, as the chair of the subcommittee knows and, and uh, others, I voted uh, against extending the benefits to heterosexuals because I don't approve uh, of undermining marriage by having heterosexuals. And I agree with the point that at least homosexuals would like to be married in many cases. I think that is actually a valid debate. But this isn't about public funding. This is about uh, allowing um, uh, individuals to purchase because what we have is a government pooling that helps deal with catastrophic and pre-existing uh, conditions questions because the pool is bigger. And because the pool is bigger, you can get a policy at five to 6,000 because we've heard in the healthcare debate figures of 20,000 also, these kind of costs what it takes to an individual to replace ERISA. And this in effect says if you're, uh, 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 if a government employee is a caregiver uh, has the 51% standard, living in their home, uh, at no cost to the federal government if they choose, whether it's a, a, uh, a, a child or a relative who, who is, has special needs and they've decided to care for them. Uh, as as the, the gentleman from California pointed out, uh, I know of a, when I was a staffer, a fellow staffer whose uh, uh, sister was killed and she wound up with her children. Um, that. Uh, this would enable them to buy additional uh, in insurance. And uh, I think it, it, that while I had concerns, because there's no cost, because it extends, if, if really we're going to say whether you're, um, that there are people who really need coverage and we ought to find a way that they can have access to relatively affordable coverage. It's not cheap, it's, but it's relatively affordable to others. So I'll now yield to the author of the amendment uh, for what I think is a creative way, and who, by the way, has legislation that basically tried to accomplish Would the gentleman this, yield? And this is a way to do it. Uh, Mr. Issa had asked me first, then I'll. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, it's, it's frustrating to me that at the end of this long night, it's really about new money for a new benefit at a time in which Americans are suffering. And people on the other side of the aisle, broadly, keep talking about who can afford what. The American people cannot afford to pay more taxes or to deal with this deficit. If there are offsetting sa savings, Mr. Chairman, the American people deserve to have federal spending cut down to help reduce, reduce the deficit. So when, they, when the President or someone else finds an offset, 
The truth is what they're really doing is saying we don't want to give up anything. If there's any savings to be had, we want to put it into new spending. This is new spending. We believe that at least during this time in which no new spending should be allowed, in which spending should, and cost of government should be brought down, at a time in which you have almost $120,000 as, as the average income of the Federal workforce worker, we should not be saying, woe is me, the Federal worker can't spend three or four or $5,000 more to provide high quality health care for somebody they choose to have supported by them. On top of that, in the existing law, if the domestic partner that's spoken of here, uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts kept slipping, calling it marriage, uh, but the domestic partner, if they work for Lockheed Martin, they're going to come onto the federal uh, health care plan. Lockheed Martin's going to get a savings, and the taxpayer is going to pay more. Well, we're still going to pay the same price for Lockheed Martin or some other defense contractor, because as we all know, huge parts of at least the federal workforce here in Northern Virginia and, and Washington. The fact is, their domestic partner, if they don't already work for the government, probably works for somebody that works for the government. This was intended and is still intended to be the last best hope to say, where have the blue dogs gone? When are we going to say that if we want to do more for the federal workforce, let's find ways to do it that doesn't cost more money? There's, Mr. Chairman, there's real reform that's needed. There's reform that needs to happen. We need to make sure that the federal workforce is not where uh, other companies dump their spouse in order to have us pay for both sides. I would hope to work for, with you on that. I hope you will reconsider on this amendment. It is the only new, completely neutral to all concerns of why somebody is supporting somebody else. I would hope that it passes on a voice vote, and I yield Re back to the gentleman. my time and yielding whatever seconds I have remaining to the subcommittee chair. I thank the gentleman, but I think the time has expired. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes, I would yield uh, my time to Mr. Lynch. Strike the last word. I would strike the last word. Uh, thank you. I just want to point out what, what's really happening here with this. Uh, right now, uh, for and, and we have to remember we're acting as an employer here uh, on behalf of federal employees. And right now, uh, we pay, the government pays through the taxpayer, 72 percent of the, the premium for federal employees as workers, and the workers pick up 28 percent. That's the way it works. Uh, what you're saying here with this amendment is, sure, we're going to allow you to have coverage as well as uh, unmarried heterosexual couples, but we're going to pull the 72 percent of the premium away that the, that the employer provides. They're saying, yeah, you can have the nominal benefit, but but there is no benefit. You're going to have to pick up not only your 28 percent of the premium, but you're going to have to pick up the 72 percent that your employer used to pay in order to cover your spouse, uh, excuse me, a uh, domestic partner. So there's no, there's no, this is a shell game. There's, there's, there's nothing here. And, and as far as talking about Lockheed Martin and some of these other big corporations, there are a whole lot of corporations that already pay for uh, domestic partner benefits. And I don't think you have to worry about folks who might be paying 5 or 10 percent of their pay coming over to the federal side because they've got much more lucrative uh, deals with, with private industry. Just that uh, we, we are comparing, remember, two employees. One is a gay or lesbian person working for the government, very valuable and productive employee. The other is a heterosexual employee very good employee, very productive, and this is about how we treat them in the workplace, what benefits they shall provide. There's a whole slew of benefits that accrue to the married heterosexual employee that are denied. So we don't have equal pay for equal work for federal employees. This is about equality. It's about equality. And uh, I think as, as our nation's largest employer, uh, we should be setting the example here. We should be the, the shining example of what, what being an American worker is all about. And uh, we should not be denying uh, these benefits to these 
individual workers because of their sexual preference. That's the bottom line. I yield back. Illinois controls the time. Uh, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Anyone else seeking recognition for? Yeah. Question is on the ISA amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposers say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. And any other amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have one more from amendment. Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. It's a good one. It's a good one, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chaffetz. Number 61, if I could. And I, I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I would. Uh, as, correct, designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2517. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. And the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you. I know the hour is late. This is done in the spirit of making a true minor adjustment. I would appreciate the indulgence of my colleagues to please look at page four uh, of the uh, town's amendment. Um, and just understand it. I'm going to go ahead and read it if you don't have it in front of you. But the spirit in which this is being offered is one of trying to assess some degree of commonality. And so if you read the current amendment offered by Mr. Towns, starting on line 13, it says such individuals have a common residence or do not have a common residence because of financial, employment-related, or other reasons. And what I struggle with is this, or other reasons, which seems to me to have no limitations whatsoever. The spirit of what we're trying to do this is we're trying to give some sort of definition to these partnerships so that they have some sort of commonality associated with them. And I'm, I, I, there is financial, uh, reasons for the, the, that uh, they may not be able to be physically together at the common residence. They're employment related. As the gentleman from Massachusetts brought up, uh, overseas uh, uh, work assignments, those types of things. What my amendment simply does is takes out the ambiguity of four other reasons and tries to close that door just a little bit, but still stay within the spirit and the letter or, or the, the spirit of having this idea that there's some degree of commonality and, and the, you know, the authors of the legislation have tried to identify some things, I don't think it's a huge leap to eliminate the four or, or other reasons and we can still achieve what the author is trying to achieve. And, would, and clearly, I'm opposed to this legislation, but would, I do think that this... Would the gentleman yield? Sure, absolutely. The gentleman presumably is offering this for clarity because he's concerned that other reasons could be too broad and ambiguous. Yes. The gentleman, however, even with this change, were it to be adopted, would oppose the underlying legislation. Yes. Um, would the gentleman confirm for me his understanding, which is mine, that in order to qualify for this benefit, should this become law, an individual would have to sign an affidavit. Is that not correct? That's my understanding, yes. That affidavit would have to spell out the other reasons, presumably. Presumably. And that affidavit would have to be accepted. Well, that's, I guess, my point, is that uh, there's uh, a... Well, but if you could, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to establish, it's not like it's quite as vague as you presented. There's actually a process, and presumably, in the legislation, is it further the gentleman's understanding that should somebody falsify an affidavit, there are penalties. Is that correct? I'm not sure. Mr. I'm not Chaffet, sure what the penalties would the gentleman are. yield? Yeah, I'm going to re reclaim my time for a moment and yield to uh, the gentleman from California. I, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you for yielding. Uh, Mr. Connolly, under the current rule, you don't have to be gay. You only have to be the same gender, and you don't have to support the other person. They can have a full-time job somewhere else, uh, and you can simply have some sort of a committed relationship undefined. But the way the bill is written, the word other either you would make no declaration as to why you were separated or you would simply put the word other and you'd meet the requirement and other is undefined so other could be because we actually don't 
ever get together. We are just committed as pen pals. So I am not trying to be superfluous, but it is a word that is unnecessary if, in fact, you are saying, A, we are committed, B, there are only two valid reasons to not be living together if you are a couple. One of them would be uh, you know, financial and the other would be work. I don't know what the financial is, but we are accepting those two as reasons. And I yield back to the gentleman from Utah. Well, uh, I thank you. Uh, yield to the gentleman. Go ahead. Did you want to? Are you yielding to me? I'm trying to, if yeah, you like. Thank, <laughs> I, thank, I thank my colleague. And I take the ranking member's point, but let me put a different case. You, you, you use the word only negatively. But other reasons might be, for example, I have a sick relative that I have to tend to for some period of time, and so we are not living under the same domicile for that period of time. Uh, and that might be a perfectly legitimate reason for why I'm not under the same roof with my partner. So it, it need not always be because somebody is playing a game and being a pen pal, as you put it. It actually might be uh, a, a real case, a human need, where somebody is trying to help somebody else but would still qualify otherwise for domestic partner benefits. I yield back. I, I thank my friend for yielding. Yes, again, I, I, I think the spirit of what uh, was offered by the author was the idea that there was some degree of commonality. I think this helps uh, uh, narrow it just a little bit by not having it being so open-ended that the, anything could qualify by just, as the gentleman from California said, by simply just writing the word other. And uh, I think uh, that's consistent with what was originally offered. And uh, I see my time is about expired. I will yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. Uh, <coughs> Will the gentleman yield? A question? The gentleman's uh, time has expired. I know, well, I would like to move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. The gentleman's uh, argument sounds sincere, and uh, he raises some good points, but I'm just curious if the gentleman has a barrel of other amendments that. Uh, this, this is my final amendment. That's all I have. <laughs> Well, I'm considering well, I'm the I'm Afghanistan this, amendment. Look, I'm working on the Afghanistan one right, still, but, but. <laughs> here's what I'm suggesting. Uh, the gentleman raises a, a valid point. However, I don't think uh, that the drafter, uh, because they included other, it was a catch-all sort of category. And there are some examples. Suppose your spouse is in a nursing home, and you know. So there are some things that we haven't thought of that might be, might, might be added to, to provide those, that clarity, but would also reduce the scope of, of the amendment as you desire. And, and I'm just saying that perhaps on a floor amendment, if we did agree to accept this, we might agree that a floor amendment might, might delineate those distinctions uh, further, but, but it would be a, a floor amendment. But, but or, or, or the manager's amendment. Or the manager's yes. amendment. That's good. Gentlemen, yes. uh, I, I would yield. The, the, my uh, question would be because obviously school could be another nursing home, some kind of such as to narrow the scope to a legitimate function. Gentlemen, yield. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not going to rule on this. The chair is going to have to rule on this. But I, I think if if we understood that there would be a further opportunity to clarify this thing, we, we might be well served and the bill would be well served uh, by doing that. Yeah, gentlemen, thank you very much. And, uh, gentlewoman from California. Uh, I'd like to strike the last word. Uh, recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I too think that this um, amendment could be crafted in a way to address uh, the gentleman's um, concern here. I think that we have to look at other issues be besides financial and employment related. I think we need to look at health or family crisis, some language that would be broad enough to anticipate the kinds of things that happen in a family setting that could keep uh, partners away from each other. I yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just move the strike last word. Mr. Chairman, I believe that this amendment could be accepted with an understanding that on a bipartisan basis 
the, the deleted language of other would be acceptable to be replaced with language that the Office of Personnel Management could give us which are generally accepted as reasons for people to be away and that that language would not be would, would unacceptable. Yeah, of course I would. Let me just say that, uh, you know, um, uh, I would like to work with you between now and the time we go to the floor on this. I am not prepared to accept it tonight, but <clears> I'm, I would like to work with you on it and I think it is something that we could accept. You know, but, um, okay. Uh, if we withdraw Mr. the amendment, Mr. Chairman, would you agree that a manager's amendment would be produced so that some alternate language would then be in that amend amendment, uh, realizing we can't predict what that language would be, but we certainly cannot rely on an amendment on the floor other than the manager's amendment? Uh, that is reasonable. Okay. Uh, I would ask the gentleman to consider withdrawing his amendment so that we can do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, uh, the spirit of uh, uh, working a bipartisan way to help narrow the scope, I would be happy to withdraw uh, the amendment uh, and work uh, across the aisle and try to come up with some acceptable language that is uh, within the same spirit of what is trying to be accomplished here. Right. Right. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Any other amendments? Mr. Chairman, I, I think it's now nine o'clock. <laughs> we will now take recorded votes on the amendments previously. Ordered. Let's start with uh, the unfinished business is the Chafee Amendment. Chaffetz Amendment. Mr. Towns. Mr. Chairman, am I? Uh, which, which, which amendment? Amendment on which the uh, prevail, no voice. Okay, the clerk will call the roll. The clerk will call, designate the amendment. The amendment. Uh, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. Right. 2517 offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Zero five nine. Right. This is the one that, uh, by OPM, that's the one that did. It starts off delay. page 63 after line 9. Right. Yeah, one. definitely. Okay. That's the Kirk will, anyway, the Kirk will call the roll. Mr. Towns. No. Mr. Town votes no. Mr. Kandorsky. Mrs. Maloney. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes no. Ms. Watson? No. Ms. Watson votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? Yes, no. Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly no. votes no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Ms. Captor? Ms. Norton? Okay. Oh. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Kennedy? No. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Yeah. Mr. Van Hollen votes no. Mr. Quayar. Mr. Hodes. Mr. Hodes votes no. Mr. Murphy. No. Mr. Mur Murphy votes no. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. V Welch votes no. Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster votes no. Ms. Speer. No. Ms. Speer votes no. Mr. Driehaus. No. Mr. Driehaus votes no. Ms. Chu. No. Ms. Chu votes no. Mr. Issa? Yeah. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Yeah. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Aye. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Bilbray? Mr. Bilbray votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Flake? Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Schock? Mr. Luke Kmeyer? Mr. Luke Kmeyer votes aye. Mr. Gow? Mr. Ken Jorsky? Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Cummings? Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. 
Mrs. Maloney? No. Mr. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Cooper? Ms. Captor? Mr. Cuellar? Mr. Micah? Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. Flake? Mr. Flake votes aye. Mr. Schock? Mr. Gow? On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were, I'm sorry, Mr. Kanjorski, I don't have you recorded. I do not. Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Uh, Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Uh, Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Uh, you are recorded as a yes. I'm yes then. Uh, on that vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 21 no's, 11 yeses. So the amendment is not agreed to. Next one is the uh, uh, the Doma one, which is the Jordan Amendment. Be Jordan. Yeah, Doma one, the Jordan Amendment. Jordan twenty three. Mr. Towns. No. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski. Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mrs. Maloney. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Cummings. No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Tierney? No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay? No. Mr. Clay votes no. Ms. Watson? No. Ms. Watson votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Ms. Captor? Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Kennedy? No. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Davids votes no. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Van Hollen votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Hodes. No. Mr. Hodes votes no. Mr. Murphy. No. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster votes no. Mrs. Spear. No. Ms. Spear votes no. Mr. Driehaus. No. Mr. Driehaus votes no. Ms. Chu. No. Ms. Chu votes no. Mr. Isa. Aye. Mr. Isa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Aye. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Bilbray? Aye. Mr. Bilbray votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Flake? Yes. Mr. Flake votes aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Schock. Yeah. Mr. Schock votes aye. Mr. Luke Kemeyer. Aye. Mr. Luke Kemeyer votes aye. Mr. Gow. Clerk will report. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 22 no's, 12 ayes. <coughs> and the amendment is not agreed to. Next is DOMA 2, the ISA amendment. The ISA amendment. Mr. Towns. No. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski. Uh, yes. Mr. Kanjorski votes yes. Mr. Mrs. Maloney? No. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Tierney? No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay? No. Mr. Clay votes no. Ms. Watson? No. Ms. Watson votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. 
Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Ms. Captor? Ms. Norton? No. Mr. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Kennedy? No. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Van Hollen? No. Mr. Van Hollen votes no. Mr. Cuellar? Mr. Hodes? No. Mr. Hodes votes no. Mr. Murphy? No. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Foster? Ms. Foster Mr. Foster votes yes. Ms. Speer? No. Mr. Uh, Ms. Speer votes no. Mr. Driehaus? Yes. Mr. Driehaus votes aye. Ms. Chu? No. Ms. Chu votes no. Mr. Issa? Yes. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Aye. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Bilbray? Mr. Bilbray votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Flake? Mr. Flake votes aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Schock. Mr. Schock votes aye. Mr. Luke Kamire. Mr. Luke Kamire votes aye. Mr. Gao. Mr. Cooper, I don't have you recorded. No. Mr. Uh, Cooper votes no. I have him. What the vote? On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 20 no's and 15 ayes. Amendments right. not agreed to. And the next one is the uh, Bill Bray Amendment, the ID um, um, Amendment. Mr. Towns? No. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? No. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Tierney? No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay? No. Mr. Clay votes no. Ms. Watson? No. Mrs. Watson votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mrs. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? No. Mr. Cooper votes no. Mr. Connolly? Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Ms. Captor? Ms. Norton? No. Mr. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Kennedy? No. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Van Hollen? No. Mr. Van Hollen votes no. Mr. Cuellar? Mr. Hodes? No. Mr. Hodes votes no. Mr. Murphy? No. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Foster? Mr. Foster votes aye. Ms. Speer? No. Ms. Ms. Speer votes no. Mr. Driehaus? Aye. Mr. Driehaus votes aye. Ms. Chu? No. Ms. Chu votes no. Mr. Issa? Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Ms. Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Aye. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Bilbray? Aye. Mr. Bilbray votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Flake? Aye. Mr. Flake votes aye. Mr. Fortenberry? Yes. Mr. Fortenberry votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz? Aye. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Schock? Aye. Mr. Schock votes aye. Mr. Luke Kamire? Mr. Luke Meyer votes aye. Mr. Gao. On the vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 20 no's and 15 ayes. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, the question now is on adopting the town's amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2517 as amended to the House with the recommendations that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 2517 as amended to the House. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Opposed? No. In the opinion of the chair. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, on that I ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Towns. Clerk, call the roll. Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mrs. Maloney. Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings. Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Ms. Watson. Aye. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper. Aye. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mr. Connolly. Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Ms. Captor. Ms. Norton. Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Aye. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Mr. Quayar. Mr. Hodes. Aye. Mr. Hodes votes aye. Mr. Murphy. Aye. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster votes aye. Ms. Spear. Aye. Ms. Spear votes aye. Mr. Driehaus. Aye. Mr. Driehaus votes aye. Ms. Chu. Aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Mr. Isa. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Micah. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Westmoreland. Mr. McHenry. Mr. Vic McHenry votes no. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Bilbray votes no. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake votes no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry votes no. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Schock. Mr. Schock votes no. Mr. Luke Meyer. Mr. Luke Meyer votes no. Mr. Gow. Hey. On yep. that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 23 ayes, 12 noes. Right. The, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 2517 is ordered reported. Uh, thank all of the members. This concludes our business for today. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered and reported uh, without objections. Gentleman from uh, the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Davis, has asked to be a co-sponsor of 2517. He has to be the co-sponsor. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. The committee stands adjourned.